For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Rockfall on the mountain is a merciless force of nature that shows no mercy to those who dare to tread its slopes. Each loose rock and pebble becomes a potential projectile capable of wreaking havoc and devastation. Those who venture into these perilous realms face the ever-looming specter of sudden death or debilitating injury. One wrong step, one misplaced handhold, and the mountainside can unleash its wrath with a deafening roar. No amount of preparation or experience can guarantee safety when faced with the indiscriminate fury of cascading rocks. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Grand Teton National Park, a sanctuary of nature's grandeur where rugged peaks pierce the sky. In the shadow of the towering Tetons, one cannot help but feel a sense of awe and reverence. The jagged summits, cloaked in snow and kissed by the sun, stand as sentinels of time bearing witness to the passage of millennia. Grand Teton National Park, a treasure trove of natural wonders and breathtaking landscapes, beckons adventurers and nature enthusiasts alike to immerse themselves in its splendor. Here, amidst the towering spires of the Tetons, visitors are greeted by a symphony of sights and sounds that evoke a sense of wonder and awe. From the majestic grandeur of the Grand Teton itself to the tranquil beauty of Jenny Lake, Every vista is a masterpiece painted by the hand of nature. For those seeking adventure, the park offers a myriad of opportunities for exploration and discovery. Hiking trails wind through alpine meadows and dense forests, leading intrepid travelers to hidden waterfalls, secluded valleys, and panoramic viewpoints. Rock climbers test their skills on the sheer granite faces of the Tetons, while kayakers and rafters navigate the wild rapids of the Snake River. The Tetons consist of six major peaks. The Grand Teton is the highest of the peaks, Mount Onan, Tiwanat, South Teton, Mount Moran, and the Middle Teton. As the name suggests, Middle Teton is situated between Grand Teton and South Teton. It has an elevation of 12,804 feet or 3,903 meters and offers climbing opportunities for those seeking a challenging ascent. The most magical aspect of Grand Teton National Park is its ability to inspire a deep connection with the natural world. In its quietude, one finds solace for the soul and a renewed appreciation for the wonders of creation. Whether standing in awe of a towering mountain peak or gazing out over a tranquil alpine lake, visitors cannot help but feel a profound sense of reverence for the beauty that surrounds them. In Grand Teton National Park, every moment is an opportunity to witness the extraordinary beauty of the natural world and to forge a deeper connection with the wilderness. For Phil White, his Middle Teton climb would be a disaster. During the summer of 2013, Phil White, a 54-year-old resident of Spencer, Wisconsin, embarked on a thrilling expedition alongside his longtime companions, Kevin and David. Together, they aimed to conquer the Middle Teton in Grand Teton National Park, Blessed with friends who shared their passion for outdoor activities, such as skiing, biking, kayaking, running, snowshoeing, camping, and mountain climbing, they sought yet another adventure after successfully scaling Mount Hood. While contemplating their next challenge, the trio considered tackling the Grand and the Tetons. However, Phil convinced them to opt for the Middle Teton, which he deemed a less daunting climb. Accessible via the Lupine Meadows Canyon trailhead through the South Fork of Garnett Canyon, the route was described by the Park Service as strenuous, encompassing a 13-mile or 21-kilometer round trip. Recognizing the physical demands of the endeavor, Phil, Kevin, and David devoted considerable time to training and conditioning, undertaking numerous backpack workouts to prepare themselves for the ascent. So, on Friday afternoon, Phil and his companions embarked on a road trip and established their base camp at Culture Bay by Sunday. Following this, they cycled to the Jenny Lake Ranger Station, where they completed registration procedures, obtained their backcountry camping permits, and secured their beer canisters. Monday morning saw them returning to the trailhead to commence their ascent of the Middle Teton. After reaching an elevation of around 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters, they set up a temporary camp and retired early for the night. Throughout the evening, they experienced some light rain and distant thunderstorms. However, by the following morning, conditions seemed promising, 
a clear blue sky perfect for their endeavor. As they began their ascent, the tranquility was abruptly shattered by the ominous rumbling overhead. Rocks of varying sizes from small pebbles to large boulders started plummeting toward them, prompting a frantic scramble for safety. David would recall, there were two rock slides, one little one where it was like marbles and golf balls and stuff like that. We each ran in our own direction and after a period of time it stopped and we kind of got together and discussed what that was. Then the sound was like thunder and then it sounded like a jet taking off and then the rocks came and we were sitting there discussing it. Within a minute, it happened again. And so then we all ran back to our original hiding places where we all felt secure. Kevin and I went in one direction and Phil jumped into this hole where he had been. As I was watching the rocks roll down, listening to all this thunder, I could see that these rocks were rolling right over the direction where Phil was. And I thought Phil was dead. I didn't know how he could have lived with the size of the rock that rolled over him. Witnessing the massive rocks rolling over Phil's location, David couldn't help but believe that Phil had been fatally injured. He anticipated the grim task of uncovering Phil's remains, expecting the worst possible outcome. David estimated that he was approximately 40 yards or 36 meters away from Phil's position, situated to the side and out of the direct path of destruction. Nonetheless, rocks continued to rain down on his location, posing a constant threat to his safety. Adopting a defensive posture, David tucked himself behind a large rock, shielding his head with his left arm as rocks plummeted towards him. Despite the chaos, most of the rocks passed over him and down the valley, sparing him from serious harm. As the rock slide subsided, the area filled with a thick cloud of dust, reminiscent of fog rolling across a lake. The aftermath of the rock slide left the valley eerily quiet and obscured by the heavy dust cloud. David noted that the entire ordeal lasted for approximately a minute and 15 seconds, with the descending rocks creating a vacuum effect that intensified the movement of the dust down the valley. David recounted the stark contrast between the deafening noise of the rock slide and the sudden silence that followed. The familiar sounds of wind rustling through the trees or birdsong were absent, leaving an eerie stillness in their wake. He felt as though he was enclosed in a coffin. The image of Phil trapped beneath the rolling rocks etched into his mind. Surveying the area, David estimated the size of the space where Phil was buried to be comparable to that of a house. He called out to his companions to ascertain their safety, receiving confirmation from Kevin and Phil miraculously. With Phil located, the priority became digging him out from beneath the heavy rocks. Together with Kevin, David began the arduous task of excavating Phil from the debris. The rocks varied in size from bowling balls to end tables, presenting a formidable challenge. Despite the physical toll on their bodies, they persisted, driven by the situation's urgency. Taking a brief respite to tend to his scraped and bleeding forearms, David glanced down the hillside, observing the rocks stained crimson with Phil's blood, a sobering reminder of the perilous ordeal they had just endured. David recalled, when I looked at him, he, his entire head was covered in blood, kind of going around his eyes and the nose and his mouth. And it was eerie that I said I was going to get him out. But in the back of my mind, I wasn't sure I was going to get him out. When they started digging me out, it was kind of, kind of difficult because they started digging the rocks that were right next to me but then the rocks were just caving in. Once the rocks were removed from around me, I noticed the head laceration, which wasn't much. I saw the amputation of my finger and I knew my arm was definitely broken. I looked down and once they got me, the rocks off me and I could look down at my leg. It kind of freaked me out, knowing that it was blood and the bones were sticking out. I could see one leg was pointing in one direction and the other leg was pointing in the other direction, but the blood was not the arterial blood. That was such a big thing and it was so close that it could have been arterial blood and that wouldn't have been good, Phil said. David recounted feeling a surge of adrenaline as they moved the massive rocks during the rescue effort. Despite the daunting size of some of the rocks, they managed to clear them away in less than half an hour. After freeing Phil from the debris, David hurried down the trail to seek help or assistance. Without a signal on his cell phone, he encountered a hiker with a spot device, a satellite communication tool designed to alert emergency responders of one's GPS location. Though unfamiliar with its operation, David and the hiker attempted to activate it, uncertain of its functionality. 
Lacking confidence in its reliability, David opted to continue his descent down the trail. Meanwhile, Scott Gunther, the Jenny Lake District Ranger in Grand Teton, received a report of a rockfall incident in Garnet Canyon, where Phil was located, approximately a mile from the summit. Scott promptly contacted the ranger station to initiate a rescue operation. Although the activation of a spot device confirmed an incident on the mountain, the precise location remained unclear. Utilizing their resources, the elite Jenny Lake Climber Rangers, equipped with access to a helicopter during the summer months, ordered a rescue aircraft to transport personnel to the accident site. Initially, the severity of the situation led rescuers to prepare for the possibility of having to move large chunks of rock to reach the victim. However, upon reaching the scene, they discovered that most of the debris had been cleared. Recognizing the urgent need for medical attention, they employed a short haul technique to transport a litter to the site, which would allow them to safely evacuate Phil. Phil waited anxiously for assistance to arrive, feeling a growing sense of impatience. He was going into shock. Upon spotting the helicopter, he initially felt a glimmer of hope that things might improve. However, his optimism waned as the helicopter circled and departed, leaving him with a sinking feeling. Unable to land directly at his location, the helicopter touched down in a different area, requiring rescuers and rangers to hike to his position with a wire basket. As the rescuers approached, Phil overheard their conversation about his condition. Compound fractures, a broken arm, a head laceration and a crushed finger. Observing Phil's extensive injuries, the rescuers recognized the severity of his condition, acknowledging him as one of the most severely traumatized patients they had encountered in the Tetons in quite some time. Early on, arrangements were made to have an air ambulance stationed nearby. This air ambulance stood ready to transport Phil in the event of any conditions beyond their ability to treat on site. The primary concern was the possibility of internal bleeding for which only definitive care at a hospital could provide a solution. Therefore, the urgency was to expedite Phil's transfer to a medical facility. After Phil was extricated from the rocks, the rescuers warned him about the discomfort he would experience due to his injuries when they secured him in the wire basket. Indeed, the pain was excruciating, reaching a level of 10 on the pain scale as they strapped him in, despite the agony Phil was airlifted down to the air ambulance. Once Phil was brought down, the rescuers assessed him further with the assistance of the air ambulance's flight team. Subsequently, he was transferred into the care of the medical professionals aboard the air ambulance, which then transported him to the hospital for definitive treatment. Reflecting on the incident, it was acknowledged that such large rock slide events were rare, and Phil's case was considered an anomaly the increased rainfall preceding the climb caused the rockfall, which was attributed to unfortunate circumstances. Despite the unfortunate circumstances, it was deemed a stroke of bad luck rather than anyone's fault. Following the rescue, Phil underwent multiple surgeries and an extensive rehabilitation process. Physical therapy sessions, dressing changes, and a gradual return to normalcy marked his recovery journey. Despite the challenges, Phil remained resilient participating in various outdoor activities and treasuring every moment as a gift. Throughout his recovery, Phil was overwhelmed by the outpouring of support. Phil emerged from the ordeal with a newfound appreciation for life's fragility and the importance of cherishing every moment. He considers himself very fortunate to be alive. Phil said, somebody asked if I cried very much during this whole experience. 5% of my tears were why me? but 95% of my tears were the overwhelming support and prayers from friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, and strangers. I had people give me rides to therapy, do my yard work, brought me meals. I'll never ever forget that. Every day is a gift. You don't know what tomorrow brings. You work hard, play hard, make new friends, keep the friends you have, and get back the friends you may have lost. People say, man, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And when I think about it, no, I was in the right place at the right time with the right people. The consequences of rockfall are brutal and unforgiving. Bones are shattered, flesh is torn, and lives are irreparably changed in an instant. Survivors are left to grapple with the physical and psychological scars, haunted by the memories of falling debris and the screams of the injured. In the mountains, there are no second chances, no appeals to reason or mercy. 
It's a grim reminder of the inherent risks of mountain travel, where every step could be your last. Surviving a rockfall in mountainous terrain requires quick thinking, awareness, and preparedness. Be vigilant and constantly assess your surroundings, especially if you're in an area prone to rockfall. Keep an eye out for loose rocks, unstable terrain, or signs of recent rock slides. Plan your route carefully, avoiding areas with loose rock or steep cliffs whenever possible. Stick to established trails and paths to minimize the risk of encountering unstable terrain. If you anticipate the possibility of rockfall, wear a climbing helmet or other head protection to reduce the risk of head injuries. If you hear or see rocks falling nearby, seek immediate shelter behind a large boulder, rock wall, or sturdy tree. Protect your head and vital organs by curling into a ball and covering your head with your arms. If caught in a rockfall, move quickly but deliberately to get out of the path of falling rocks. Avoid panicking and focus on finding the safest escape route. If you can't move out of the path of falling rocks, crouch low to the ground to minimize your exposure. Cover your head and neck with your arms to protect against impact. After the rockfall has subsided, wait for the area to stabilize before attempting to move again. Be cautious of secondary rockfalls or debris that may continue to pose a threat. Always assess the risks before venturing into mountainous terrain and take appropriate precautions to minimize the likelihood of encountering rockfall hazards. Important survival tips so you can avert an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.